right. Man, you guys sing well. Good job. When worship, great. Fun to worship together. It's so good. It's good for the soul. It's good for the spirit. If I've not met you yet, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, so glad to be with you this evening. For those of you who join us online, let me rephrase that. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad to see you this morning, right? Good morning. So uh, real quickly, before we head into the series, I just want to take a moment and say, uh, as we are in 4th of July weekend, in all that it represents for our country, how thankful I am for the opportunity to worship freely, worship Jesus freely. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's so many, it doesn't matter what institution it is, there's always really good things and also other places where you're like, yeah, that's, I wish I could hide that one from the other people, right? Uh, it's our country and there are things about it that aren't necessarily always perfect, but I will tell you the ability to worship Jesus freely, I will forever be thankful for. So a lot to be thankful for this weekend. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Um, I, there was so much red, white, and blue here tonight. I had to say something, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So we are doing a series drama when God shows up in our mess. And uh, Christy and I kicked off the series last week and we did it together, kind of our joint teaching time. We always do this when we start a new series. Uh, one of the things that happened is we had a first class example of drama showing up in our mess Sunday morning at our Larkspur sister church. And since, since I didn't want you guys to miss out in all the fun, I, we're gonna show you a little clip from last Sunday morning. So let's, let's run this real quick. Have you read the Old Testament? Like, is there moments where you read and you go, the God used that person? That's a mess. That is a mess. Right. Yeah. So, so why do we study the Old Testament? Let's do it. Let, let's talk about that. Because I think sometimes the temptation is to say, look, Jesus came, like he fulfilled all the stuff, right? He did, he's got his New Testament thing. Why do we have to go backwards? There's lots of really weird laws, like don't boil a goat. And it's, I mean, like, what? Like, I don't understand all this, right? And we lose some of that understanding that context because we didn't grow up in that environment wow you have a hole in the bottom i understand that but, <laughs> but, but, thanks tim Damn, that's your ipad <laughs> i think it was a notebook for what it's worth a right back okay. oh thank you okay. amy oh <laughs> oh no 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 that you can't use that that's that's for baptism that's <laughs> that that is their towel that's their towel no, that's mine. oh no that's yours i'm sorry my bad <laughs> ward girls i've got you i was trying to protect you from coffee towel <laughs> so we were talking about drama and mess. I mean. And, well, that is a lot of drama. That's right. That cannot Oof. have been more appropriate. Okay, so why do we study the Old Testament? I'll let you just do your thing. Um, because here's the thing. The Old Testament, all of the stories Oof. of the Old Testament, yes, Jesus came to fulfill things, right? Jesus came to be the culmination of the law. But all of the Old Testament points towards Jesus in the New Testament. This is very difficult. <laughs> oh. So we actually had people ask us afterwards if we plan that. I said, no, you don't plan for the bottom of a coffee cup to actually come unglued and start spilling coffee all over your lap. Uh, but it was such a fun moment, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we shared it with you. So here's the chat, right? What a first class example of, man, in the middle of a mess, God shows up, right? So God's not surprised by that moment. Uh, I was surprised, Christy was really surprised. And um, uh, if you wanna watch the longer version, she actually comes really unglued about a minute later and can't hardly talk. So as she's so busy laughing. So God can and will use every moment for his glory. He will even take some of the moments that we think are our worst and our most frustrating and he'll use them for his goodness, for his glory, right? Here's the beautiful part. He also uses us. He will take and use every person, even those who may not claim to necessarily follow Jesus, he will still adopt us. He'll still make space for us to come and participate. And he will still get his way. He is God. It's beautiful. He's not surprised by our moments. He's not surprised by our messes. So this week we're gonna start in the story of Ruth. Boaz and Naomi. And we're going to take this out of the Old Testament book of Ruth. We're going to do chapter one today. One of the things we realized as we broke some of these chapters up, we could have done the whole chapter today and read it, but we're actually going to show some of the Bible Project videos for each one, and then we're going to highlight some different scriptures in them. 
The book of Ruth is set during the time of Judges and there's lots of drama, lots of mess. And most importantly, it's a story of redemption and a story of hope. So as we get into this, I have a couple things I was thinking about as we're, as we're processing through this first chapter of Ruth. And one of these is, I don't know if you've heard the idea of strength and shadow sides. So the, the concept is this, that every great strength also has a great shadow. And the challenge is often for people who are really gifted in one area is that they're really weak in other areas or their shadow side comes out in other areas. So to, to illustrate this, I thought I'd give you a couple of my strengths and shadow side places. Ready? I'm going to be very self, self, self I'm trying to be self-aware, a little bit vulnerable here. Uh, I am more introverted than extroverted. And that's a strength of mine, I think. But the shadow side is that sometimes I can come across as aloof, like I'm not paying attention or I'm not focused. It's so really what I'm thinking is my brain's spinning and how can I have some alone time? Really, that's what's happening. Uh, I'm a big picture person who struggles with details. And so I'm good at the larger th processes and what we're trying to, where we're trying to go. And, uh, but as soon as somebody says, how, what do we need for that? I go, um, Christy, um, Joan, um, Stephanie, anybody else could help me with that. The shadow side of that is I forget details often that others tell me. And so I, I, if you've ever said, hey, can we hang out or do something? I'd say, send me an email or send me a text or because I will forget as soon as I walk out of that conversation. And then I enjoy coaching and releasing others, especially leaders, but the shadow side of that is I struggle with the training pieces. A lot of times I go, well, you're called. I see what God's going to do with you. Just go do it, right? Yeah, if it doesn't work out, let me know. We'll figure it out, right? It's a, there's a definite shadow side. I have to be partnered with others who really believe in the idea of training. And here's the big one. This is the one I wanna talk about a little bit tonight is that I am really, really comfortable in crisis. I'm comfortable leading in crisis. When everything is spinning out of control, right? Coffee cup falling apart on me. I'm like, whatever. Like, you know, it is what it is. There's, I can't change what's happened or even what's happening. I could just be present to the moment. But I am also, my shadow side is that I have a continuing battle with my desire for control. And when things are outside my control, that's when the shadow side, the dark side of the, you know, what's the, the dark side of the force comes out. I have found that the last two years in the midst of this pandemic, that nobody's in control. Nobody. Not one single human on this earth has had any measure of control. And it has really challenged me to be aware over and over and over again of what's going inside of me. I have a good friend, Steve Cuss, and um, he talks, he's, he's a pastor, he's an author, wrote a book called Managing Leadership Anxiety. He's been doing this podcast lately with Ruth Haley Barton, and he keeps having this conversation and brings up this concept over and over again about right-sizing problems, the importance of right-sizing problems. One of the things that, um, that he says is we struggle with anxiety when we try to make God-sized problems our responsibility. Do you hear that? When we try to take God-sized problems and make them ours to fix, God doesn't expect anything more of us than to be exactly human, and he's already gone ahead of us into all of these moments. And so this is where I find these struggles in my own self of going, man, I, I feel like I try to solve problems that only God can solve. They're not mine. And as I've been paying more and more attention to who I am, I'm being aware of where I'm at, I'm realizing that we can find God in these moments and be present to ourselves and others if we're willing to trust God. Because ultimately this is a factor of, do I really trust God? Do I really trust God? When everything falls apart, will I trust God? Well, as we look at Naomi's story today, you're gonna find that everything falls apart for her, everything. And she's, she's got this continuing struggle to decide whether or not we can trust, she can trust God. So what I want to do as we head into this, and, and we'll finish with some time to process, is that my guess is that many of us are grieving, hurting, struggling with doubt, maybe unbelief, maybe, we're, maybe we've got other emotions going on. And I think one of the most powerful things for us to do is allow ourselves to be present to those emotions, to those things happening, 
and then trust God. So let's pray real quick, and then we're going to dive in. We'll do Ruth 1, and we're going to start with the Bible Project video, okay? So, God, you are good. You're good. There is nothing about our lives that you are surprised by or confused by. And I ask that even to this evening, this morning, as we engage with this story, that we would see ourselves in the story, Lord. We would see the places where you want to speak hope to us in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of brokenness, God, that we would find your hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's watch some Bible Project. The Book of Ruth, it's a brilliant work of theological art and it invites us to reflect on the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. There are three main characters in the book, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Boaz the Israelite farmer. And their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. Let's just dive in and see how this all unfolds. Chapter 1 opens with this line, in the days when the judges ruled. And it reminds us of the very dark and difficult days from the book of Judges. And here we meet an Israelite family in Bethlehem, struggling to survive through a famine. And so in search of food, they move on to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. And there the father of the family dies, and the sons marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And then the sons, they die too. And so they leave only Naomi and these new daughters-in-law. And so Naomi, she has no reason to stay anymore, and so she tells her new daughters-in-law that she's moving back home. And Naomi, she knows that the life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be very hard, and so she compels the women to stay behind. Orpah agrees. But Ruth does not. She shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi, and she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will become my people, and your God will become my God. And so the two of them return to Israel together. And the chapter concludes with Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew, and she laments her tragic fate. So as we head into the story, uh, we're gonna go straight to verse six, but let me just say there's a lot of drama that happens in the first five verses of this story. And sometimes when you tell story, you skip over some of the parts to get to the part of the story of hope and redemption. But let's not be lost on the fact that for Naomi, when we get to this place in verse six, that she has already lost her husband, both of her sons in a foreign country. And the heartbreak of, first of all, leaving her country and going to another country, then losing her, her family, her loved ones, probably the grief is really, really raw. And we know it's true because when we get to the end, she says, um, my name is now Mara, which stands for bitter. So verse six, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of the people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the, to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home and, another husband, and of another husband. All right, so in this first section, there's really fascinating themes out of the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth isn't written just for the people of Israel for this time. It's actually a story of hope that was often recited by those in exile in Babylon many years later. And what's so powerful about the book of Ruth is it taps into some of those covenant things we talked about last week. Remember, we talked about the covenant Abraham had with God. And the covenant was around two big things. It was around land and it was around people. Okay? So it was around the land that God had promised Abraham and then again later promised to Moses and to Joseph and the people of Israel. And then later even brings the exiles back to the land. So there's this beautiful theme of, of land that's continuing covenant thing. And it speaks of hope in a really difficult time. Remember, we talked about Judges was not a great time. That there were these cycles of no running away from God, falling flat on your face, realizing, oh yeah, we should probably cry out to Yahweh, things getting better, 
then we run away from God again, right? It's a cycle that they would do over and over again. It was mostly filled with leaders who were pretty self-focused. Now, there were exceptions, but it was pretty self-focused. And so in this story of Ruth, we find a larger picture. So Naomi's family is forced to leave because of the famine. They go to the foreign land of Moab where her sons marry Moabite women. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But this is not like going to Canada or England for us, right? Where they speak the language, we kind of share some similar things. This would be like, uh, more like Russia. It's an enemy state. Think of whatever other state you want to drop in there. Right now, Russia is kind of the, the enemy du jour, right? Because of all the war stuff going on in Ukraine. But think about going into a place that we would say and define as a country right now are our enemies. That's what this is like for them. It's pretty intense, right? And uh, after her husband and sons die, the famine's over, Naomi decides to return home. So this is this larger story, right? For Israel, this story speaks of hope about this idea when the exiles will be brought home, that they were living in a land that was not their own. For us, the people of Jesus, the followers of Jesus, the believers, this also speaks something too, that this is not our home. There will be a future home for us. And we can find hope in the fact that we can live in certain places and be present to what's happening there in that place, with that, those people, with that community, and still recognize that ultimately it's not our home. There's all kinds of scriptures in the New Testament that talk about this is not our home. I picked out just one. How about Hebrews 13, 14? For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. The kingdom of God has come with the coming of Jesus. It is coming through the people who say yes to following Jesus, and it will be complete when Jesus comes back. Okay? This is not our long-term home. So there's also this continuing theme of return that goes along with home. There are 12 different places in this first chapter where the Hebrew word for return is repeated. Now, it's not translated that way to us, but you'll see it all kinds of places. Go back, return, over and over and over again. It's this picture of go home. And since, uh, so Naomi is now really, we could call this chapter, by the way, the, the return, right? But for Naomi, she's now returning home. What's fascinating is Ruth cannot return since she's not from there. But she goes anyways. So it's really Naomi's return. And I think this also speaks to the second part of the covenant, people. So let's get the next text, section of scripture, verse 14. As they wept aloud again, then or, this is right after she says, go find husbands and make your life again. Uh, Orpah kisses her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods, and her gods, catch that, go back with her. Verse 16, incredibly important. This is probably one of the most famous verses in the Old Testament. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn my back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. That part's shared less. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. What a powerful, powerful moment. Amazing. So we'll come back to her little speech here in a minute, but let's start with this covenant idea of people. Uh, I have this wonderful slide, and here's the slide. Here's my, here's my precursor to the slide. I created the slide with two parts for those who are really love maps and those who love art. And if you love both, I'm giving you both on the same slide. So it's like a smorgasbord, right? So here it is. This is the picture I have for you. This gives you an idea where Moab is in relation to Israel. And so the picture you see on your left is a, uh, it's called Ruth and Naomi's Journey. It's by an artist out of Columbus, Ohio, Cody Miller, Cody F. Miller, uh, actually a friend of Noel's as well. And it, just a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of the journey and what that probably was like. And so if you're not interested in maps, just focus on the, on the painting, right? It's beautiful. If you're interested in maps on your right, what you're going to see is you're going to see where you've got Israel and you've got Moab. Moab's there in the purple, right? And so they're separated by the Dead Sea and all the things going on there. So 
It's fascinating that it feels like it's really far away, but it's not that far away. But in that time and in that culture where there's not airplanes, there's not even cars. They don't even have wagons. They're literally walking and sometimes riding on donkeys if they can afford them. That if the journey would have been very, very long. So let me tell you a little bit more about Moabites, all right? They're direct descendants from Lot. If that name sounds familiar, they're, they're the, Lot was the nephew of Abram. Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Nobody else, okay, all right. So Abraham's nephew, he was the guy that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. I know you know that story. Even if you don't know the role of the facts, you're like, oh yeah, that's bad, right? Yes, it is bad. Lot had two sons born out of sexual brokenness. I'm not gonna share the details of that story because it is really hard and I do not have time to explain all that. But his two sons were Moab and Ammon. The Moabites and the Ammonites are all throughout the Old Testament harassing Israel over and over and over again. It's amazing when things come out of brokenness and out of sin and out of depravity how they, come, how they then stand against the things of God over and over again. So for the people of Israel, uh, they would have seen the Moabites as really bad folks, right? They're the enemy. They're not just the enemy, they're, they're the enemy that we don't talk about. They're those cousins from that side of the family we just don't talk about, right? What's fascinating though, there's a really wonderful in, um, scripture out of Deuteronomy 2.9 where it says, it was by God's hand the Moabites occupied their land. So somewhere along the line, God makes a choice that these people are going to continue. God has plans that we don't always understand. And they did not worship Yahweh. They essentially worshiped lots of different gods with idols and that sort of thing. So for Ruth and Orpah, they come from a lineage that most Israelites would go, yo, we don't hang out with those folks. We just, they're not our people anymore. For the New Testament, we have the Jews and the Samaritans, right? Over and over and over again, there's all constantly moments where, where the Samaritans keep coming up and you realize that compared to most Jewish people, they think they're the bad guys. Here's the beautiful thing. Let me pause for just a minute and talk about different cultures and different races. There are no bad guys. There are no bad guys. In this world, every human that's ever been created is created by a father God who wants to have relationship with them. And when we start seeing people as good and bad based on the, the color of their skin or their ethnicity or their country they come from, we miss the point that they are God's creation. God's creation. There are no bad guys. Now they're broken people who make really hurtful and painful decisions that cause problems for others. But ultimately God's desire is that everyone would come to faith. That all people would come to see God. All right? So Ruth chooses to follow Naomi. Um, it's incredible loyalty that she's showing to her mother-in-law. Uh, even in the midst of this, Naomi fully recognizes that it's gonna be hard to find another Jewish husband for, for uh, Ruth or for Orpah. And so Orpah weeping kisses and says goodbye. By the way, Orpah's still a good person. If you notice this moment happens while they're on the journey. This doesn't happen before they leave. This happens on the journey. Where so Orpah at some point has traveled with her mother-in-law and with Ruth to do this thing, to be loyal to her mother-in-law. And once, once Naomi says, hey, you should go home to your people, she says, okay, I will do that. Fascinating that this discussion takes place after they've already started, just amazing to me. And I, I think that Ruth's response to follow Naomi is, is extraordinary. She's under no obligation to follow Naomi. And by the way, I think Naomi's response is just as amazing that she lets her come. She's not under obligation to provide for Ruth either but they're now linked together. All right, let's go back to rereading verse 16 again. Can we toss that back up on screen? But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. And here's the key part. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Remember, we just talked about it. For the Israelites, their covenant understanding of their life with Yahweh as their God was all wrapped around one of two things, land and people. And what Ruth is saying here is, I will change my place, my home, my land to your land. I will change my people 
to your people. And not only that, I'm saying, telling you now, I'm done with all those other false gods. I am going to choose Yahweh from here out. This is nothing short of a conversion moment. And there are no other recorded examples of this kind of stuff like in the Old Testament, not like this. I mean, this is really powerful to make this kind of statement. There were no, there were no uh, immigration laws in those days. There was none of that. And what's fascinating for me is that she continues to be called Ruth the Moabite throughout the chapter. But here's what's amazing, is Ruth is in the lineage of Jesus. Matthew 1 tells us, Matthew 1 mentions four women that are in the lineage of Jesus, and Ruth is one of them. God will take the outsider and turn the redemption story into one of larger redemption for all people. He's not limited by where you come from. He's not limited by your social status. He's not even limited by the fact that maybe you've had a previous marriage. None of this stuff scares God. No matter where you are in your journey, God can show up and make redemption out of your story. Beautiful, so beautiful. And by the way, as we keep reading this, it'll be over and over again, the scripture will say Ruth the Moabite. I think it's another really important lesson here and I'm just gonna drop this in, this is just a freebie. Don't let other people define you. Don't let them define what you're identified by. Only God can do that. And when we find ourselves, this goes back to what Christy talked about last week, when we find ourselves dialing into the false self, we find ourselves taking an identity that's not God's, there's brokenness that always comes from that. Be defined only by your relationship with Jesus, all right? All right, so back to the larger story for Israel. This would speak this, this hope when the exiles will be brought home, the people of God brought back together. For us as believers, after Jesus, the story speaks of a hope when we are reunited with Jesus for eternity. What a beautiful day that will be. Lots of different places in the New Testament that talk about this. I'll give you one, Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are citizens of the most high God. We are sons and daughters. Those are our people. So drama, when God shows up in our mess, what a lot of drama happening here, right? We got death, we got marriages to, to foreign people, moving to a foreign land, right? All these different things happening. Loss of life, death, grieving, loyalty, Standing with somebody, hurt, sadness, brokenness. I think what's beautiful about this, Kelly Shorstein gave us a, an update on the, they, our curriculum for our children just went through Ruth. You know what the big idea of chapter one was? Gives us, uh, God gives us companions. A beautiful picture, right? As Ruth says, no, I will not leave you. I will journey with you all the way home. Boy, what a beautiful picture. This could point to the Holy Spirit, of course. It could also point to the importance of community living life together. So who has God sent alongside you in the midst of your mess? All right? All right, let's finish this story up, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. The women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Verse 20, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. End of chapter, Mike drop. Wow. Where's the hope, Mike? It's there. We just have to look for it a little bit. Let's talk about it. Man, what a hard moment, though. Like Naomi seems to hold it all together and then she gets home and she goes, bleh, right? She gets around her people and she starts vomiting all over them. I think this is actually good. I think this is healthy. I think this is important. I think this is where I want to finish as we talk about this morning, what it means to follow Jesus. This powerful moment. So let me give you a little bit of understanding of this moment, though. The whole town was stirred. The word there is really means it has excitement. This idea of people were excited that Naomi had come back. She shows up. People go, Naomi's here. And what's fascinating is when they arrived, they were excited because of them, not because of her. 
wasn't just Naomi. They actually were very welcoming to Ruth. There's this beautiful picture of they welcomed her into their culture, into their family, into their, into their larger picture of who they were as the larger family. It's beautiful, right? Larger community. And so this response tells us that Ruth was really loved. That Ruth was probably one of those people that other people looked up to. I'm sorry, Naomi. I meant to say Naomi. I'm sorry about that. They haven't met Ruth yet. They're just meeting her for the first time. What I meant to say was Naomi was really loved. Clearly, she had lived life well with others that when she returned, people were excited to see her. What I didn't find in there was they weren't asking about her husband or, no, I'm just kidding. So uh, the response tells us that Naomi's love, and you would think it would lighten her pain, but it's the opposite. The name Naomi means lovely, lovely. So she says, no longer call me lovely, call me bitter. Oh, wow. So I'm sure the rabbi of the town showed up and said, hey, we have a really good grief counselor who can help you process through these things and what you're struggling with. She returns as Mara because God has made her life very bitter. Now, why, and this feels overly dramatic, but it's not. In the Middle Eastern culture, family was everything. You were identified by your family. You made plans based upon what was best for the whole family. And I'm not talking about Italian mafia right now. I'm talking about back in Middle Eastern culture, this was the way you operated. And, and all your dreams were for your family's success. And your family was your, per, your identity, whose, whose son or daughter are you, who, what's, your, what's your parents' name. Your career, your job had nothing to do with that. It was all about family. Therefore, having and raising children was the most important role for women in that culture. And I'm sure for many of you mamas, you're like, yeah, it, it, feels like, it feels like the hardest job I've ever had, right? And you understand the pain and the, and the joy that comes from being a parent. So for, for Naomi, this is, this feels like death, like I just to return home to die. There's not much here for me. It's so powerful. So I think what's fascinating is uh, we get stuck on the why is she bitter? I think it's more important to see the how that the things she says in this statements, ready? She says, the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune on me. I don't know if you recognize this, but in every one of those statements, she's blaming God for her predicament. Do you see that? What I find incredibly fascinating about this particular text, if, if we pull back just a minute, is why it's still even in the Bible. Why didn't some scholar, as they were putting together the Torah, the Old Testament before it became the Old Testament, right, when the Jews just followed it, why didn't they leave that part out? Why did they include that part? And why didn't God put on some sort of moment to say, hey, maybe let's not include that part. That feels kind of dark. I think it's because the importance of recognizing where we are. Man, I, I don't know what your, what your journey of faith has been like, but we talked about this last week a little bit, right? We want people who walk with a limp. We want people who are honest about their struggles and the real life they live. Following Jesus is not all sunshine and rainbows, right? Cotton candy. I don't know, whatever thing like makes you think happy thoughts. It's not butterflies, right? It's not always that stuff. And we get stuck thinking it's got to look a certain way or else I'm not doing it right. That's a lie. That's a lie. And the power of this story, in this moment of this story, is that we can recognize Naomi's hurt and brokenness and her blame towards God. And you know what? God can take it. God's not surprised by a single thing she's saying here because he knows what's in her heart. 
So why do we hold back and pretend like everything's okay when it's not? Man, let's get real. So when we talk about drama, God showing up in our mess, this is a messy moment. And I promise you, the whole group around at this moment is trying to figure out, how do I respond? How do I be present to her? Maybe I should give her an encouraging word. Maybe I should quote something out of Genesis. No, nope, nope, not Leviticus, we'll do something else. Right? They're really having that moment of going, how do we respond? God is comfortable in our mess. It's incredibly instructive the stories left in. I think just like David's Psalms that are laments, shows us that God is not afraid of our humanness. He doesn't want our right answers, he wants our heart. He doesn't care about our right theology. He doesn't care that we get everything right, he wants our heart. In this moment, for Naomi, it's a gut level heart response around people she feels safe with, and it's really powerful. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? I think first of all, we need to start with a self-assessment. What am I feeling? What's going on internally inside of me? Do I hear this story and go, ooh, I can't do that. Boy, Naomi's in trouble, right? No, God's going, this is my daughter, man. Many of the Psalms are laments. If you find yourself struggling with tapping in even what you're feeling, sometimes reading laments can help us get there. I got a couple of them specifically for you. One is Psalm 13. And the other one, really, really dark, by the way, Psalm 126. And I just wanna encourage you that even as you read these Psalms, don't look at them for all the words. Let the words help you identify what's going on inside of you. What do you need to be honest about with yourself, with God, that you're not? By the way, he already knows, right? It's not like he's going, man, I had no idea Mike was feeling that. Huh, should have been paying more attention. What are you feeling? Anger, secondary emotion. So what's really going on? Grief, anxiety, doubt, unbelief. Now, if you're listening to me right now and you go, but Mike, I'm in a really good place right now. I'm in a place of joy and hope, great. Here's my encouragement to you. Be present with others in their stuff and don't fix them. Just be present. Man, that's the beauty of us being the family of God. Let others in. Social media isn't the place to do this, by the way. It's just not. I'm sure there will be some that will respond with grace and kindness, but most will actually respond in ways that are rather hurtful, right? as they work out their own stuff. This is the kind of thing that needs to be done face to face with one another. We talked about this as we just finished our series, The New You, the transformation piece. And we talked about how uh, the, in our brain science, how the neural networks are, or there's new neural pathways created in our brains as we sit with one another, listening empathetically to their story without trying to fix. Just listen and being present with them. The power of being with other people can't do that on social media. It needs to be face to face. It's really powerful moments. So who is safe for you to share this kind of life with? Are you connected? Are you in a community or in a small group? If you do not have a community, please see Joan. If you join us online, please email Joan. She will connect you with community, with people who will journey with you. If you're stuck, try out one of our prayer team members. One of the beauties about the way we've trained our prayer team folks is they're not going to try to give you advice. They're not going to try to fix you. They're going to be present and go, what is God speaking in this moment? And how can I pray for you in that? That's the way we do prayer. We're not counselors. We're prayers. All right. And then lastly, here's the last thing. Invite God. Invite God. And by the way, when I say invite God, I really mean invite hope. We got to invite hope. And the only way to get that is through God. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 126. Uh, worship team, if you guys will come on back up. Psalm 126, it, six, it's, this is out of the message version because I really like the way this reads. It seemed like a dream too good to be true when God returned Zion's exiles. 
We laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them, God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. So this first part of the Psalm is remembering how God brings people home, right? Returning people to land and covenant. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives so those who planted their crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. Do it again. There's two powerful things out of this psalm that I really want you to see. One is this idea of gratitude, that it starts out by remembering the times that God has actually shown up and done really great things. Man, we've got to be people, people of gratitude, people of thankfulness, people that actually look back at these moments and go, okay, God, I thank you for that one. That one was really good. Thank you. So important. The ways that God has come through. And then we, when we stand in gratitude, I think it leads to hope and joy, even in the midst of our circumstances that may not change. And then we ask God, do it again. Come on, God, one more time. I know I feel like a broken record. I know I asked you yesterday and last week and last month and last year and 10 years ago and 30 years ago, whatever. Do it again. I need you again. He's a good father. He doesn't withhold from his children. He wants to come and meet you. Now here's the check. It may not look like it solves your circumstances, but he'll meet you here. He'll come to this space. As a church family, we like to take communion. So if you're in the room, if you'll grab your communion elements, if you're joining us online, if you wanna grab some bread or some water or bagel and coffee, whatever works. My encouragement to you as we head into this communion time is what is the Lord stirring in you? So after we take communion, if you've got something you want somebody to join you in prayer, go grab somebody else in the room. We're not gonna do kind of formal prayer time. We're just gonna make it available. Grab somebody close to you. You usually sit around people you already know and kind of like, right? So let's let somebody pray for you. Be present with you in the moment. And so as we head into communion, what I want to do is take about, I don't know, 10 seconds or so, and just be honest with God about the stuff that's in your heart. He already knows. And just give it to him. Okay? So Lord, just come. Holy Spirit, come. Hey guys, Mike and Christy Colley here. We're the lead pastors at SHV, and we wanted to personally invite you to join us in person on Saturday nights for service at 5 p.m., worship and community. You know, there's a special thing about actually being with other people yeah. in the room and learning what life with God looks like. And the SHV community is full of incredible people from different backgrounds, and we're all learning how to follow Jesus together. Yeah, so whatever your story, whatever your history, whatever your dreams for the future, you have a place at the table here at SHV. Yeah, and we would love to get the chance to know you better. And not just we in a, in a large sense, but for Christy and I, we would love to get to know you. So if you are around on a Saturday and it's your first time in person, please come say hello to us. We'd love to have a chance to meet you. Yeah, and remember, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. We are all better together. And we hope to see you soon on Saturday nights. Yeah. God bless. Have a great week and hopefully we'll see you soon on a Saturday.